Bibles to Matthew chapter 1. We're going to start with the Christmas story, or part of the, a very small part of the Christmas story. We're, we're taking today and the, and the next few weeks to uh, just to think and to talk about the presence of, of God. Uh, we're going to see if we can wrap our minds around what it means for God to be present with us, for God to be with us, which is something we say all the time, we, we talk about it all the time, but I don't know, I, I just don't think that it's really, for me, I don't know that it's ever really totally sunk in. Uh, that first Christmas, the one that we're getting ready to celebrate and to remember, um, God became tangible through Jesus Christ. He became someone we could go up to and we could give him a little hug and a, a big kiss and a little hug. And, anyway. Those of you who know that, you're my people. I'm just saying that. Okay. Um, but we, we say this all the time. God is, God is with us. God in the human form. God became, uh, God was manifest among us. He became tangible. He was present. And I, I, I just don't know. And we'll see this as we go through to this week and, and next week, how, uh, what that really, really looks like. Because I didn't, I don't really think I really have a clue of what that means. The first part of the Christmas story we're going to read today is just in Matthew chapter 1. And I'm just going to read a couple of verses, verses 20 to 23. Uh, this is when the angel, if you remember, he appears to Joseph, and he talks to Joseph about what's to come, okay? And so in Matthew chapter uh, 1, verse 20, right in the middle of that, it says, here's what the angel says, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, you shall call his name Jesus, that's the name we were just singing about. For he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. Okay, so that little line there at the end just been said so many times. I, I want to see if it's not lost on us. Now, today we're not going to talk about uh, the presence of God through Jesus, Emmanuel. We're not going to get to that yet. We're going to save that for a Christmas Eve, which is going to be a really, really great time to celebrate Emmanuel, God with us. But, but Jesus, um, that's not the first time that God was with us. God has been with us even before Jesus came onto the planet. We'll talk about Emmanuel uh, on, on Christmas Eve, but... He was never, even though he was never with us like he was in Jesus, he has been present. God has been present on this planet with his people from the very beginning. So if it didn't look like Jesus, if God was with us but it didn't look like Jesus, what did it look like? And that's what we're going to spend today and next week looking at. What did the presence of God look like leading up to Jesus? And I think if we can understand that, if we can, if we can really understand what the presence of God has been like throughout history, then by the time we get to Emmanuel, by the time we get to God being born in the flesh, then that's going to, it's going to sound totally different to us after these couple of weeks, or at least that's my my, that's my hope. So today, I want to give us a kind of a brief survey. We're going to go all the way back to the very beginning and start talking about the presence of God. There's going to be a lot of story today, a lot of biblical narrative, but hopefully we'll be able to pull a couple of, uh, a couple of lessons. So I, I didn't give you another one of these, but I, you recognize this. I hope you do. Ben said, hey, haven't you given this sermon before? I'm like, thank you very much. I appreciate it. It's becoming familiar. It's becoming familiar. Good. Um, yeah, this is our timeline. We've been looking at this thing, and I, I show it to you because, first of all, today I'm going to track a whole bunch of it and just kind of talk about the presence of God through history. But uh, uh, I want you to know what we're talking about, where we are in the story of this earth, how, uh, how things interact with each other. And so that's why I show you this timeline. We're going to go all the way back to the beginning. We're going to be careful here because I, I can get really caught in the, in the weeds. But let me just say that in the very beginning, we know that God was present 
with Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, right? We know that. We're told in the scriptures that uh, he was walking around with them in the cool of the day. God was right there. He was right with them, and he was that way. They had that kind of fellowship, like the presence of God and humanity, like right next to each other, all the way up to the fall in Genesis chapter 3. And we know in the fall in Genesis, uh, things changed. Things changed. God kicks Adam and Eve, of course, out of the Garden of Eden. He puts up that, that angel with a flaming sword, and he's guarding the way to the tree of knowledge of, of good and evil. And from that point forward, God and humanity, that, that's, that presence wasn't captured again. It wasn't that same sort of side-by-side walking around in the garden together. Um, but it does, it's not that it, it disappears. Although we have to say for the next um, several centuries, I think, the presence of God, we don't really honestly hear much about. That doesn't mean that God doesn't intervene. It doesn't mean that he doesn't speak. But it's it's more of a kind of disembodied voice. He's talking to uh, different people all the way from Noah and Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Joseph all the way through the end of Genesis. He is there. He's present. But we don't really get that like side by side relationship where God is present or at least it's not talked about through the, through all the way through the end of Genesis. As a matter of fact, it's not until we jump into the story of the Exodus that we see God really being tangibly present again. If you remember, when does God appear in the Exodus story to Moses? What's the first thing he, ad- he does? He appears as a what? Yeah, he appears in the whole episode with the burning bush. He says, hey, Moses, stop. Do not come any closer. Because Moses is now in the presence of God. Do not come any closer. Take off your sandals. Uh, don't come any closer. You're walking on, on holy ground. And that event actually starts a whole new series of events where God is much more tangibly present than he has been all the way since back in the Garden of Eden. This is, begins this whole new series of events. I won't go into the whole Exodus narrative, but and remember when the Israelites are fleeing Egypt and they're being led along by the pillar of, of cloud and the pillar of fire? And there's a weird little line in Exodus chapter 13, verse 19. It says, Moses took the bones of Joseph with him. So remember, Joseph had gone to Egypt, and that's where the Israelites were when Moses comes onto the scene. Um, So he takes the bones of Joseph with him from Egypt, and it says, For Joseph had made the sons of Israel solemnly swear, saying, God will surely visit you. God will surely visit you, and you shall carry my bones up from here. God will surely visit you visit you. So Moses, when he takes the bones of Joseph out of Egypt, he takes them with that expectation that God will surely visit us. And indeed, God does. The Israelites make it all the way across the Red Sea to the base of Mount Sinai, and they're there. And God says to Moses in Exodus chapter 19, he says, behold, I am coming to you. So this is a big moment. This is a big moment because God has been present with Moses, but this is the first time that he is going to be present again, like the presence of God, the actual like side-by-side presence of God. This is all the way since way back in the very beginning. This is the first time um, that that has happened. This is the God who just rescued all of the Israelites, of course, from, from Egypt. He performed miracle after miracle after miracle. The, they, they watched him in action. When he parted the Red Sea and crushes the Egyptian army, this was a visit that was one for the record. This is something that has not happened in centuries for God to be tangibly present. And so God tells Moses, he says, make sure my people are ready. I am going to come. I am going to visit you. Um, God is going to show up. This is a big deal. You think, you know, Taylor Swift showing up for her concert is a big deal. This is a big deal. God is, God is like showing up here. So listen to this. Uh, This is Exodus chapter 19, verse 16. On the third morning of the third day, there were thunders and lightnings and a thick cloud on the mountain and a very loud trumpet blast. Verse 17 says, then it says, then Moses brought the people out of the camp to meet God. This is, this is the moment. This is the moment we've been waiting for. This is the first time since the Garden of Eden we are going to come face-to-face with God. Okay, pause the story here. Beep. Okay, number one on your outline, being in the presence and the power of God can be a terrifying thing. 
the Israelites are about to figure this out firsthand. They're about to learn this firsthand. Job says something interesting in Job 26. He says, behold, these are but the outskirts of his ways. In other words, we're just getting to see a little bit of a fringe. How small of a whisper do we hear of him? He says, but the thunder of his power, who can understand? Um, so the, the Israelites, what they're about to do, Moses brings them out of the camp to meet God. What they're about to do is they're about to see the actual manifest presence and power of God. They've seen it. They saw him part the Red Sea. They saw all the destruction that came from that. And now they're standing there and they're at the foot of Mount Sinai. It says Mount Sinai is wrapped in smoke. Moses is talking to God. God is responding. Every time God responds, it's like thunder. It's like thunder. We're like, oh man, how Cool would it be there to be there and, and watch all that. That's actually not what happens. That's not it at all. It's not cool at all to the Israelites. They have this whole experience at the foot of Mount Sinai, the smoke swirling around, the thunder and the lightning, all this stuff going on, and they're like, nope, we're out. They get close, but they don't want to do it. They don't want to actually meet God. And so they turn around. They're like, no, we're out. We're out. Because, because what did I say? I said, uh, being in the presence and the power of God can be a terrifying thing, right? So Exodus chapter 20, verse 18. Now when all the people saw the thunder and the flashes of lightning and the sound of the trumpet and the mountains smoking, the people were afraid and they trembled and they stood far off and they said to Moses, you speak to us and we will listen, but do not let God speak to us lest we die, right? This is their, this is their reaction. I'll, I'll tell you, Christians, as we... As we think about the presence of God, this is something that I do not want us to miss. It is an awesome and a terrifying presence. And I know, man, people don't like to talk about it that way anymore. We say, oh, it's not fear. It's just, you know, it's just awe. It's just reverence. And, and that, I mean, that sounds great. It's just not what the Bible says. Um, when the people s stand in the presence of God, they, they, it says, the Bible says they're terrified. They were afraid and they trembled. I don't know when the last time you just like involuntarily started shaking because something was terrifying you that much. It's exactly how it says the people of Israel respond. Listen, we have to understand the magnitude and the enormity and the weight of the presence of God if we were going to have any hope of understanding Emmanuel on Christmas. Otherwise, Emmanuel is not going to make any sense to us. That little baby being born in a manger, he just looks like a baby. He just looks like a baby. But that little baby, that is the same little baby who Isaiah stands in front of in the throne room and says, Woe is me, for I am done. I am lost. I am a man of unclean lips. I dwell among a people of unclean lips, for my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Right? That's, that's the baby in the manger. See what I'm talking about? See how we, we kind of mess this up? We don't understand the enormity, the magnitude, the, the fear that people felt standing in front of God when we picture this baby. It's kind of lost on us. Every time someone is in the presence of God in the Bible, you know what they do? Boom, they fall on their face is what they do because they're standing in the presence of, of God. Ezekiel in Ezekiel 128 says, such was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of God. And when I saw it, I fell on my face. We cannot miss this about the presence of God or we will miss the power of Christmas. We can't miss this. Emmanuel is no trite thing. Emmanuel is no trite thing. Being in the presence of God can indeed be terrifying. Now, being in the presence of God, as we'll see, as his son and as his daughter is a different thing indeed. We'll get to that in a little bit. But let me keep the story going on. So the people standing there at the foot of Mount Sinai, they're terrified. They don't want God to speak to them anymore. They say, Moses, you speak to us. So God and Moses continue this relationship. They, uh, this is when God gives Moses the Ten Commandments. Um, God tells Moses in Exodus chapter 25, verse 8, he finally says, okay, let's do this. Because he can see the people are terrified and they've got all. He says, okay, let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell in their midst. And so God asks the people of Israel to build him the Ark of the Covenant so that he can be with them. So for those of you in the room, all of your knowledge about the Ark of the Covenant comes from Raiders of the Lost Ark. Um, this, is, this is really going to help. Remember when that guy gets his face melted off? That was, that was quite, quite cool. Um, I almost used the sermon title, Beyond Indiana Jones. I thought that would kind of work here. 
Um, but it's really important for us to understand why the Ark of the Covenant is significant. Uh, God says in Exodus chapter 25, verse 22, he says, There I will meet with you, and from above the mercy seat, from between the two cherubim that are in the Ark of the Testimony, I will speak to you. So this is the place where God is going to meet, and he is going to speak with not only with Moses, but eventually with the people of Israel. The Ark of the Covenant is literally hosting the presence of God. And God has himself in some way contained because he understands the fear and he understands the magnitude of his presence that the Israelites are feeling every time they seem so he kind of allows himself and I sent out this email about this he allows himself to be contained in this in this box so the Israelites build this box for him and they carry it around with them for 40 years they're carrying around the presence of God in the ark of the covenant um, it's not for a while until uh, they're granted access into the promised land, but during that whole entire time, 40 years, they carry around the Ark of the Covenant, and it is really the manifest presence of, of God. They're carrying that with them in the Ark. When they finally cross over the Jordan, Moses is no longer with them. They cross over the Jordan. They enter into the promised land. Um, God is still speaking to them through the Ark, and the Ark comes to rest at a place called Shiloh. This is conquest and settlement. It settles right here in this place called Shiloh. Shiloh is only, it's real close to Jerusalem. It's about 20 miles north of Jerusalem. Right now it's in the West Bank in Palestinian controlled territories. It's a beautiful spot. Matter of fact, go to that next picture. If you've ever been to the central coast of California, it kind of reminds you of that area. It's just a, a really amazing spot. So the Ark of the Covenant comes to rest right there and it'll stay here in Shiloh. The presence of God stays here in Shiloh for quite some time. Matter of fact, several hundred years, the presence of God, the Ark of the Covenant, will rest in Shiloh. All through the entire period of Judges, the presence of God is going to stay in Shiloh. Have you ever, uh, have you ever had something in your house that at one point was really, really important to you? And then over the years, I don't know, you know, it just kind of gets shuffled backwards. Maybe it ends up in a in a drawer or in some box in the attic. I don't know if you've ever had something like that happen. So the Ark of the Covenant stays in Shiloh for several hundred years. And you're going to watch now. It's kind of funny how these, the Israelites swing to these extremes. They go from utter terror to utter neglect on this hand. The Ark of the Covenant's there in Shiloh, and it's almost completely forgotten we don't hear about it except sort of passing glances uh, throughout the entire period of Judges. It's not until uh, 1 Samuel chapter 4 that we pick up the story of the Ark of the Covenant, of the presence of God again. Uh, you might remember this, but the Israelites are fighting uh, a battle against the Philistines. And uh, you can go to that next slide. They're not doing very well. The battle's being fought over here in Aphek and Ebenezer. And uh, you can see over there to the right is Shiloh. This is where the Ark of the Covenant is. And so the, uh, the Israelites get into this battle with the Philistines, and it doesn't go very well. They, they lose the first couple of skirmishes in the battle. They come back to camp, and they regroup. And then somebody has the bright idea to say, hey, uh, didn't we have the presence of God somewhere with us? Like, wasn't that, didn't we have that at one point? Somebody else says, yeah, it's in Shiloh. I'm kind of making a little bit up here, but it's like, yeah, it's in Shiloh. Let's go, let's go get it. Let's go get it. And they're going to bring it over and they're going to have it help them in this battle against the Philistines. So they go to Shiloh. They bring the Ark of the Covenant back. And as soon as the Ark of the Covenant comes into the camp, there's this mighty roar. Whoa, yeah. The people of Israel are so excited to have the Ark of the Covenant in camp. With a matter of fact, the Philistines hear about this. They hear this roar and they're like, oh no, what just happened? And they start to think, they're like, oh no, they must have brought some gods into the camp with them, is what they really think. They think they brought gods into the camp uh, with them. And, and they say, who can deliver us from the power of these mighty gods? These are the gods who struck the Egyptians with every sort of plague in the wilderness, right? So although their theology isn't quite right, it's just one god, um, but they, they know the stories. They know the stories of the Exodus. They know the stories about this box. They know the story about the presence of God and what that has meant. So immediately they're they're terrified. They're like, oh no, some brave Philistine soldier, he tries to rally the troops. He says, hey, take courage, men, be men and fight. Let's do this thing. They kind of get all rallied up. They go back into battle. The Israelites are carrying the Ark of the Covenant with them. They go back into battle and uh, Israel loses again, this time terribly, 
It says 30,000 foot soldiers are killed by the Philistines. And then we get this one little line about the presence of God. It's in this 1 Samuel chapter 4, verse 11. It says, the ark of God was captured by the Philistines. They stole the presence of God from Israel. It's kind of tempting for us to say, well, God's everywhere. God wasn't really in the box, you know, this sort of a thing. But that's not the way that the presence of God was working with the people of Israel. As a matter of fact, we'll see this. Not to say that's not true. But what we see is that this, this box, the, the, the Ark of the Covenant, actually had some very specific, very special meaning. So let me just stop and just think about this here for just a second. So the Ark, the presence of God, sits in Shiloh for hundreds of years, largely ignored. And through the whole period of Judges, the Ark is just mentioned in passing like a, a couple of times. It's pretty much forgotten until Israel needs a victory. The presence of God is almost entirely forgotten until Israel needs a victory, right? That just sink into your mind a little bit here. Number two on your outline, God's presence is not a good luck charm. Um, I feel like this is still a struggle for us just as much as it was for the Israelites. Like, no one is paying attention to the presence of God until the bottom falls out. Nobody really cares about having God present with them until something goes wrong. And then all of a sudden it's like, oh yeah, oh wait, oh yeah, didn't we have a God who we serve? Like maybe we should call him into, into action. I, I talked about this a couple of months ago. I talked about this idea of, I called it blessing security, and I couldn't come up with a better term, so I'm going to stick with that. Blessings, like somewhere along the way, we have mistakenly placed our security in the blessing of God rather than in God himself. Right? That's where our security is. It's in what God is going to do for us, what God is going to give to us. Our trust cannot be more in a manifestation of God's favor than it is in God himself. It can't be more in just his blessing than it is in God himself. Because there's a difference between trusting God and trusting the things that he is going to do for us. Hey, we're losing in this, we're losing in this battle. Maybe we should go get God to fight for us. I mean, we didn't think to bring God with us into the battle in the first place. But now that we're losing, maybe we should call on him and we'll see if he can help out. Someone said when the ark of, is treated as a talisman or as a magical device with which to manipulate God, everything goes wrong. God cannot be used. God cannot be used. It's amazing how, how often we do this. Like we don't, we don't have God as part, as present in our everyday lives. I mean, in our, in our conversations with our coworkers, in our conversations with our spouses, in the way that we act on game day at the party. God isn't part of any of those things. But all of a sudden when something goes screwy, we turn around and we go, oh yeah, where was God again? I forget. Wasn't that somebody who's going to do something for me? I'm not trying to be harsh because God can be, we do this all the time. I do this all the time. We all have this tendency to think of God more as a problem solver than someone who we do life with because he is present all the time. It's just what we do as human beings. And, and God is gracious. Thank you, Lord. Because way more often than not, he will come and he will bless us even if we just brought him in as a backup plan. But we are missing out on the fullness of the presence of God if he is just a genie in a lamp that we rub when things go wrong. Right? Thomas Kelly is a theologian. He said, how then shall we hold, lay hold of the life and power and live the life through the presence? By quiet, persistent practice in turning all of our being day and night in prayer and inward worship and surrender toward him who calls in the deeps of our souls. Just talking about the presence of God, as, as Christians, we need to become so enamored with God himself, with God himself, not just what we can get from him. Amen? Amen. All right, we'll move on. We'll keep the story going here. Um, so now the Philistines have control of the ark. Uh, they bring it down from Ebenezer. 
It ends up, they're kind of toting it all over the place. It ends up in this place called uh, Ashad. And when it comes to Ashad, it wreaks all kinds of havoc in Ashad. This is kind of that idea that the presence of God is really contained in the Ark of the Covenant. They bring it into the temple of their God. Their God's name is Dagon, the Philistine God Dagon. They bring it into the temple of Dagon and they put it in there with the statue of Dagon. And uh, they leave, they go home, they come back in the morning and the statue of Dagon is like down on his face in front of the Ark of the Covenant. And so they're like, remember, I told you, not just people who fall down on their face in front of the presence of God, but even uh, idols, it appears. Um, So the statue's on the ground. So they take the statue, set it back up, put it back up, and they stand in there, they leave, they come back. In the morning, they come back. This time, Dagon is down on his face again, but this time, boom, decapitated, doesn't have any hands. And I just, it's just such a funny picture to me. I just picture God going like, I don't know, he just fell over, you know? It It wasn't me, I didn't do any of that. Um, so, uh, the, all sorts of things have start happening in a shod though, because of the presence of the Ark of the Covenant, people start getting these tumors. They have this plague of, they have this plague of rats. It wreaks all kinds of, of havoc in a shod. And so eventually they're like, let's get this thing out of here. This thing is causing too much uh, damage. So they try to send it over to their buddies over here in Ekron. They're like, Hey, you guys take this thing. And they're like, well, what's it like? We're like, we're not telling you, don't worry about it. You just take it. But <laughs> The people of Ekron, they heard the stories. They know exactly what's going on. They're like, no way, we don't want that thing either. Get that thing out of here. So you can see the red arrow, it kind of traces. They're getting it back to Israel because this thing is so problematic. Um, it, they send it back to Israel, but they send it with a guilt offering. It's going to end up way over there on the right in Kiriath Jerim. Um, but they send it with a guilt offering. And here's what the guilt offering is. This is so weird. The Bible can be so weird sometimes. First Samuel chapter 6, verse 4, I quote, We'll send it back with a guilt offering with five golden tumors and five golden mice, according to the number of the lords of the Philistines. So, I don't know, they put this whole concoction together. It's the Ark of the Covenant. It's five golden tumors, five golden mice, and they send this Ark of the Covenant all the way over here. It ends up, they tie it to some cows. It ends up over here in uh, Kiriath Jerim. And uh, that's where it's going to stay. It's going to stay there for the next 20 years. The presence of God is going to stay there for 20 years until King David comes onto the scene. Uh, Matter of fact, a few weeks ago when Joey taught, he taught on this passage on Psalm 132. You might remember this. It says, Remember, O Lord, in David's favor. All the hardships he endured, how he swore to the Lord and vowed to the mighty one of Jacob, I will not enter my house or get into my bed. I will not give sleep to my eyes or slumber to my eyelids until I find a place for the Lord, a dwelling place for the mighty one of Jacob. This is David. Remember how David was said to be a, a man after God's own heart? Can you see the change? Can you see the transition that's happening? Somebody like David who steps up and does something that nobody else is even thinking of. They're like, man, I'm, he says, I'm not going to sleep until we have the presence of God back with us. I'm not going to even give rest to my eyelids. David wanted the presence of God so badly to be among the people. He wanted it even more than, he wanted even more than, he wanted sleep. He, he, he just cannot live without the presence of God. You see the change. This, is, this should stir something inside of us today. Number three, do we have a passion for the presence of God in our lives? Or does it not really even matter to us? Does it not really even matter if somebody comes along and says, God is no longer present in the American church? Does that freak us out? Does that matter to us? This should ignite something inside of us. I'll tell you a picture I have in my own head of the way that I think I treat the presence of God. Here's what it looks like. Like, let's say I go on a, do something with a group of friends. Uh, Maybe we go on a hike and I turn around and there's like God standing there. I'm like, oh, you're coming too? Oh, cool. Oh yeah, great. Come on. Now listen, you don't have to come if you don't really want to. You can, you know, you know, if you've got other things to do, you can, like, I feel like that's kind of the way that I think about this. And I'm, I'm coming to this understanding, you know, Moses said, if your presence does not go with us, we don't want to go. We don't want to move. We don't want to take a step if your presence is not with us. Like, do you have that craving, that desire for the presence of God in your life? Do you have that desire for the presence of God in your life? Because listen, Peace is not going to come from the absence of trouble, right? Alexander McLaren says this. He says, peace does not come from the absence of trouble. It comes from the presence of God. 
peace in your life is going to come from the presence of God. God says to Moses after Moses says, I don't want to go without your presence. God says to Moses, my presence shall go with you and I will give you a rest. I will give you rest. Not just in times of difficulty. Not just when the bottom's falling out, but in everything you do, do you have a present or do you have a passion for the presence of God in your life? When David uh, wants to bring the ark into Jerusalem, it is because he is so passionate about having the presence of God there in the city that he established as a capital. As a matter of fact, we'll kind of finish our story with that. If you remember when David brings back the ark into Jerusalem, it is not without some difficulty. Uh, they're bringing the ark I'm from Kiriath Jerem, and remember, the, 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 it's on the cart, and it hits the rut, and the Ark of the Covenant starts following. And that dude Uzzah sticks out his hand and tries to stop the Ark from falling. It seems like a good gesture, but God, boom, strikes him dead. Why? Because we can't forget, and it's easy for us to get, that the presence of God is still nothing to be trifled with. Right? Nothing to be trifled with. Um, so the ark gets delayed for a few months. As a matter of fact, it stops uh, just for a couple of months right outside of Bethlehem, which uh, it stays there for a couple of months. I think God may be kind of checking out the area to see if it's a good place to be born. I don't know. Um, he probably should have made a reservation while he was there. Anyway, oh, just kidding. That's a good uh, All right, so then I'll, I'll let the scriptures kind of tell the end of the story, and we'll wrap it up. Uh, 2 Samuel chapter 6, as the ark of the Lord finally makes it into the city of David, into Jerusalem, Michael, one of Saul's, or David's wives, um, daughter of Saul, looks out the window. She sees King David. Remember King David leaping and dancing before the Lord. She despises him in her heart. This is David's kind of dance-like-no-one-is-watching moment, but... Tens of thousands of people are watching and things are flapping. Anyway, I won't get into all that, but it's just, it's not, it's not good for Michael. It, it, but he just, he doesn't care because he is so excited. He's so excited about having the presence of the Lord back in Jerusalem. They brought the ark of the Lord and set it in its place inside the tent that David had pitched for it. And so we're going to stop there. The ark gets back to Jerusalem. Next week, we'll pick the story back up and, and see what happens. But I just want to ask you, we're, we're talking about something really amazing that it will go right by us if we don't stop and think about it. And that is that through Jesus Christ, what we're celebrating on Christmas, we are celebrating Emmanuel, God with us. And I want us to understand the magnitude of that because it is no small thing that God, the presence of God, would be born, would be put into this little manger and raised as a boy. We can't pass it by. And so this is the beginning of kind of laying a foundation for really understanding Emmanuel. Amen? Why don't you do me a favor and stand to your feet and I will pray for us and we'll get out of here today. The golden tumor thing, I just can't get over it. I just, that's like, that's weird. God, we want to say thank you. Thank you for this time together today around your word. And God, you have been present with your people ever since the very beginning. And we, now we can go through our lives and we can go about our days like you're not even here with us. God, I want you to change that in our hearts. I want you to help us to understand and to sense and to feel your presence and your guidance and your direction. For the people of Israel, it was terrifying to stand in front of the living God. For us today, through Jesus Christ, you have given us access to the throne room of grace. God, we thank you for your presence in our lives. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 20, Now may the God of peace who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with everything good that you, that you may do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen.